Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another broadcast here on the Apocalypse Channel. We are so thankful and happy that you have joined us this evening for another prophecy update. This is not just another prophecy update, but the year in review prophecy update. One we bring at the very end of the year, one mostly dedicated to reviewing all of the things uh, that has happened over the year as it relates to prophecy. And this year, like no other, there are plenty, plenty to talk about. So we want to welcome you to this evening's broadcast. We want to say happy Sabbath to you wherever you are. If you happen to be in a place where the Sabbath has not started, we want to say happy Sabbath when it comes. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you know someone, as always, who should join this broadcast, who may receive a blessing from what we're going to talk about this evening, I want you to encourage them to join the broadcast, um, to tune in, to grab a pen and paper, to have their Bibles close by as we get ready to um, dig into God's Word for just a little while here on the Apocalypse Channel. This evening, I do have someone special that's going to be with me. Um, he will, I will bring him on a little later in the broadcast, but Elder Narlin Edwards will be with me this evening as a special guest on the Year in Review Prophecy Update. And I'm looking forward to talking to him just shortly as we dig into some of the things that have happened this year and their implications to us as God's people. And I pray and I hope that at the end of this broadcast, our hearts will be set on fire a little more. Uh, we, that we will have a greater desire to follow the Lord and to be prepared to see him in peace very, very soon. Before we get started this evening, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this moment that you have allowed us all to see and for the privilege of assembling together. Oh Lord, we pray and ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit this evening. As we open thy word, Lord, we do not do so without asking for your help. Give us understanding. Be with your people wherever they are, that they may receive a blessing from you. Speak to all of us those things we need to hear that will draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, it's good to be with you this evening. Uh, we got a little late start here on the broadcast. We do apologize for that, but we are now live. Uh, brothers and sisters, as we talk about prophecy, it is a light that shines in a dark place that gives us the ability to understand and to know what is coming next, what to be watching for, what things that are happening are important, and if they're important, what do they really mean to us? And God in his love, I call prophecy a love letter because in his love, he has given us prophecy whereby we can never have to walk in darkness. If we would believe the prophecies by faith, then we would never have to walk in darkness. Because right now, God's people everywhere, not God's people, the world everywhere are, 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 so to speak, walking in darkness and grabbing at anything, trying to understand what does all of this mean? What, 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 what is my next move? What should I be doing? Uh, they're looking at things and it's not making sense, but they know that something's not right. But God in his love has given us prophecy so that we can always look in the future through God's word and know what is coming. And we can prove that the Bible is true by looking at history that used to be prophecy. As we get started this evening, I want to open God's word and go to uh, a specific text as we launch into this evening's prophecy update. Uh, as I turn there, let's go to Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. And you know, as I look around and realize that it's December, we got one or two weeks before the end of the year, it's hard to believe that the year has passed by this fast. And not only has it passed by fast, but so much has happened in, in a relatively short period of time. It's almost unbelievable. Amos chapter 3. And we're going to re start reading at verse 3 as we get ready to get started. Amos chapter 3. 
We're going to read verse 3 through 7. Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. God's word says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And that's our key text this evening. First, can two walk together lest they be agreed? And the answer is no. You cannot walk together and continue to walk together and you be disagreed on everything. So to be together, you must agree. But then our final text in this group of texts, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So God has a way of speaking to his people. He always has. Before he does something, he reveals it unto his servants, the prophets first, then he will do it. Then it will come to pass. And brothers and sisters, we are no different here at the end of time. In the year 2020, nothing that is happening that is prophetic has not already been given to us in prophecy. So now, brothers and sisters, things that, are, that we are experiencing right now, honestly, are are, are, are the present tense and is going into history as we are speaking. We are living in the most momentous times that this earth has ever seen. We are moving to the very end of time where sin will be eradicated shortly. The world has never seen this. The universe has never seen this. It is only going to happen one time where sin will be eradicated forever. We are barreling. I almost said we are inching, but no, we are barreling towards the final crisis and, and, and the ceiling and the, and, 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 and the loud cry and the latter rain and all of these events. We are barreling towards them. The question is, do we know what we are experiencing? Do we understand what we see? And what are we doing about what we see? This is the question I ask Everyone I talk to when it comes to this conversation, wherever I'm traveling, I ask this question. Do you understand what you see? And if you say, yes, I do, then the next question is, what are you doing about what you see? Because if we understand what we see, if it makes sense to us what we see, then there should be a behavior and action that follows this belief and understanding of what we see. So the Bible says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, that, but that he showeth to his servants, the prophets, first before it happens. And so, so now, as I look into God's word, I see uh, many instances where this was done. Noah, for instance, God did not bring a flood before he told Noah. He told Noah, and it was Noah's job to inform the people and to warn the people of an impending flood. Moses, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. But there's Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Obadiah. There were many prophets that God spoke to and showed things to and made it clear to them. And then, then they were supposed to be his mouthpiece to warn his people. This is his method of speaking. And so this evening, it is no different. We'll see this evening the same correlation as uh, myself and brother uh, Narlin speak on end time events of the year 2020. But before we go forward, I want to want to lay just a little bit of a foundation. And I hope that you can actually see the correlation between what God's people had to do and understanding that we have a job that we need to do. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. It's a very familiar story, 
But it's in these stories that when we dig deep, the Lord peels back more layers of the story and gives us a greater understanding of what we're seeing and, and lets us see the correlation and how it relates to us so that we can understand that God's people always had to do the same things. And what I mean by that, they had the same journey. The, the prophet was spoken to, shown something. He then told it to the people. He warned them. There was always a time of preparation for what they were warned about. And then whatever God said was going to happen then took place. This has always been the way it is. And for us, it is absolutely no different. Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to read, we're going to start reading at verse 7. And we're going to read some verses and we'll skip over to some other verses so as not to not read the whole chapter. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters for I know their sorrows. Verse eight. And I am come down to deliver them out of thine hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites or the Hittites and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, here's what is happening. The Lord is speaking and saying, I have seen the affliction of my people and I hear their cries about their taskmasters. I understand what is going on and I have heard their plea to be um, uh, freed from this oppression, from this slavery, from this place of sin and degradation. So first the Lord saw it. But how did he see it? He, he always saw it, but his people were pleading. They were praying and asking to be freed from this slavery. You and I should be praying and asking God to free us from the slavery of sin on this earth. We should be seeking with all we have to be prepared to make it to the kingdom, to leave here, to not perish here where sin abounds. Let's continue on. Let's go over to verse 15. Verse 15. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is this is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them. The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me. This is what he's supposed to be telling them. Saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's continue on to, to verse 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto them, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go. We beseech thee three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So first, the Lord has spoken to Moses and told him that I have seen the affliction of my people and I am going to rescue them. Now, he told it to his prophet. Then he told his prophet, this is what I want you to tell the Israelites that I have visited them and I have seen their affliction and I have appeared unto you and have given you instruction on how to free them. Now, let's continue on. Now, we're skipping around, but we're just trying to lay a foundation for this is how God deals with his people. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. We're still in chapter 3. Let's go to verse 
Verse 28. Not verse 28. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 28. Chapter 4, verse 28. Exodus chapter 4, verse 28. Let's, let's start at verse 27. Verse 27. Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. We'll give everyone a moment to get there. And God's word says, And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Verse 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Verse 29. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. So now Moses has spoken to Aaron and conveyed the message that God has given him. Now they're about to go and gather the elders and to tell them and the rest of the people. So let's continue on. We're at verse 29, verse 30. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. Now, I won't go back and read this, but earlier in chapter four, Moses had said, Lord, I don't have clear speech. I, I stutter. I stammer. I'm not eloquent. I, I, they're not going to listen to me. Not only that, they're not going to believe me. And the Lord said, listen, Moses, this is what I want you to do. You see that rod that's in your hand? Moses says, yes. He says, toss it on the ground. And when he did, it turned into a serpent. So what he was telling Moses, is, I want you to do this sign in the midst of the people so that they will believe that I sent you. Then he told them, pick it up by the tail, and it turned, it returned back into a staff. Then he told Moses, reach into your bosom. And when he did so, and he pulled his hands out, they were leprous. Then he told them to put it back in his bosom. When he pulled it out, it was whole again. So he gave him these two signs and said, by it, they should believe the first one or the second one. If not, then I want you to turn their water into blood. By one of these signs, they should believe that I sent you to free them. So already God is beginning to give signs to his people to let them know that not only uh, were they going to be, that, that, that not only Moses did not show up on his own, but that the Lord had sent him to free them. And by a mighty hand, he was going to free them from the tyranny of the Egyptians. Are you seeing What's going on? Do you see the correlation to you and me? God has sent signs to you and I through his word, sign after sign that we may see them and begin to understand that we are about to be freed from sin if we are prepared, brothers and sisters. Let's continue on. So let's go over to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. By now, the plagues have been falling. The plagues have been falling. One, plague two, plague three, plague four, plague five, and so on. And so now, you know, uh, 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 Pharaoh has, you know, I, I'm going to let you go. Please just pray to your God and cause this plague to stop. And of course, Moses did and the, the plague was stopped. But earlier in chapter three, the Lord said, I am sure that Pharaoh is not going to let you go. God already knew what was going to happen. And so Pharaoh would turn, his heart would go back to being hard and another plague would come until he got down to the end. Also in chapter three, the Lord had told, told Moses to, to tell Pharaoh, listen, let my firstborn go. He called Israel his firstborn. Let my firstborn go that he that they may go and worship me. But of course, we know that he did not. Later on in Exodus, the Lord said to, to tell Mo, to, to, he said to Moses to tell to Pharaoh, listen, if you do not let my firstborn go. Then I will kill your firstborn children and the firstborn of every beast you own. 
And there will be sorrow in your kingdom if you don't let my firstborn go. But we know how the story goes. Pharaoh did not relent. He kept hardening his heart until we get down to that very plague that the Lord had promised he would do. Now, when you read these chapters, you begin to be clear on the fact that Israel should have understood that it was time for them to be freed. They were going to be delivered by a mighty hand. Pharaoh was not going to listen. But then the Lord had said, in the end, if, they, if he will not let them go, I will kill his firstborn. Now let's, let's look in Exodus chapter 11. We're at the last plague. Let's see what the Lord says to Moses and what Moses says to the people. Exodus chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1. Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. And God's word says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go hence. The Lord is speaking in the positive, like in confidence, like when I do this, he's going to let you go. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence thereafter. Verse 2. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Verse 4. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. Now, brothers and sisters, I hope that you are following me. I hope you are following the narrative here, because the Lord has spoken to Moses at the burning bush and told him to go back to Egypt. The Lord and Moses have a conversation. Moses pleads to, that he's not the one. He's not ready. And the Lord says, I have chosen you. We know he gets his family and he goes back to, to Egypt. He meets with Aaron in the mountains. He conveys to Aaron what the Lord has told him. Aaron conveys to the people what the Lord has told Moses. And by signs and wonders, they relent and believe that Moses is there to rescue them. By the 10th plague, the Lord said clearly, he told this, tell this in the ear of the people what I'm about to do. And Pharaoh is going to let you go. So now if the Lord says, this is what I'm about to do. You should get ready to go. He is not going to just let you go. He is going to thrust you out. He is going to push you out. He is going to beg you to leave. And he's going to want to give you whatever you ask for. Just leave. So y'all borrow, get jewels from your, your, your friends. Those jewels were to be used for the building of the sanctuary. Not to be worn, not to be adornment, but for the sanctuary. So now, brothers and sisters, Israel should have known that their redemption was drawing nigh. They should have recognized it was time to leave Egypt. It was time to leave this degraded life of sin and slavery and get ready to head to the Canaan land. Get ready to head to heaven. Brothers and sisters, the reason why I wanted to touch on this this evening, because this is where we are. It is time to make the journey to heaven. It is time to get prepared to leave here. It is no more time to play any more games. For if we play games, if we do not prepare, then brothers and sisters, we will be found unprepared, unready. What happens if we're unprepared? If an Israelite did not follow through the preparation that they were supposed to do, their firstborn would have died. 
That's what would have happened. We know the story. I won't belabor the point. The Israelites knew to prepare for the Passover, to kill a lamb or a goat, to put the blood on the doorpost and to seethe it and to prepare it and to eat it. But not only were they to eat it, they were supposed to eat it with their loins girded, staff in their hand, prepared to leave at a moment's notice. They were to be ready to go to the Canaan land. Are you and I preparing for what's coming? Do we understand what we see? This evening, this is our goal, is to delve into what we are seeing, to get an understanding from God's word and the spirit of prophecy of what it means, and then finally, what should we be doing? Because if we talk about what's happening, if we continue pointing out moment after moment what's happening, if we, if we catch the steady trend of events, but we don't prepare, then what good is it to know what's coming and to have an understanding of what it means and do nothing to get ready for it? Brothers and sisters, that is not what this broadcast is about. We must delve into what is it going to take to be ready to stand true to God right now. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. Very shortly, I'm going to bring in my dear friend as we delve into this, uh, this year's events. Going to the screen, I wanted to read something. God has made sure that we knew that prophecy was important, that we were to uh, look at it and study it and seek to understand it and glean from it the warnings necessary for us to be prepared for what is coming. On the screen it says, the prophetic chain. It says, the history which the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the procession of the ages, ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold as coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history. And we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. Not out of order, but in its order. Since there is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. To study the workings of providence. In the, ref in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. It goes on to say, the prophetic chain today reveals final events. The history of the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future to tell us where we are in the procession of the ages today. And we may understand what may be expected in the time to come. Everything is going to be fulfilled in its order. So now, brothers and sisters, just as the Israelites had to prepare for the Passover, they had to, they had to pay attention and follow the instructions that the Lord has given. Because if they did not follow them to the letter, when the angel of death came through, that even though they were an Israelite, their firstborn would have died. The firstborn of their animals would also have died. If you read the spirit of prophecy about their preparation, they were also told to be in their own houses. Or they could be in the house of another Israelite, but they, of another Israelite, but they could not be in the homes of of the Egyptians. For if they were in the home of another Egyptian, 
they were not going to be covered with the blood that was on their doorpost. They had to be on, they had to be in the house and the blood had to be on their doorpost. They had to be covered by the blood. Now, the Israel, I mean, the Egyptians could be in the house of an Israelite. And if so, he would have been covered by the blood on the doorpost. But it could not be the other way around. What is the instruction? What is the inference? What is the object lesson here? In preparing to go to the Canaan land. They could not still be out and engaging in worldly friendship for the sake of friendship. They could not be out frolicking around with, with people they'd become friendly with in Egypt while they were in slavery. They could not be anywhere but in their house or in the, in the house of another Israelite. Today, are we saying that it's wrong to be friends with people of the world? No, that's not what we're saying. But we should be working with all diligence to bring them closer to Christ, to bring them into our homes where they can be taught and they could see God's methods on display, how we should be living, how we should be dressing, how we should be eating. They should be drawn, being drawn closer to us. But if we're still hanging out, if we're still thinking it's time to play games, yet we're looking at the signs and trying to understand what they mean, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we are not prepared to leave here. We will not be prepared for the crisis that is coming. Brothers and sisters, if we want to see Jesus in peace, then what we ought to do is to be preparing to see him in peace. What does that look like? We're going to be talking about that a little bit tonight. We'll be talking about this again tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. on another segment of the year in review uh, as we talk about physical and spiritual preparation for the crisis. You don't want to miss that. 4 p.m. Central tomorrow evening. Well, brothers and sisters, this evening, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and, and transition over and bring in uh, our dear guest, Brother Narlin Edwards. Uh, if he is on the line, if we can go ahead and bring him in. Brother Marcus. Good evening, my friend. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. I'm doing well by God's grace. Amen. It's good to see you, my friend. I know you've been busy moving around. God has had you uh, in his vineyard and has been blessing you uh, as you've been moving about. Um, and so I was very happy to, to, to be able to reach you and to get you on the program this evening. Uh, so we've been talking about getting together for a while anyway. So, so, now, so let me yes, ask you yes. a question. First of all, how was the family? How was the, I always want to call her the little one, but she's growing up. She's not that young anymore. <laughs> yeah, her birthday is on uh, Tuesday. She's going to be five. Five. But they're wow, doing great. Time flies, man. Time flies. And I'm not, you, you, I'm seeing a synergy. We didn't talk, but we, we both have our red ties. So there, there's some kind of connectivity some there. Some kind of connection. Praise there. God. Yes. Amen. <laughs> amen. Hey, good, great minds think alike. I like to believe that. Amen. 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 So tell us now that you, you've been you've been busy in the year 2020. You've been traveling oh, yes. and moving about. And I thought earlier today you've actually been out in California where things are a little bit more out of control than they are in other parts of the United States. What, what have yes. you been seeing? What, what as you look at prophecy, as you ingest prophecy and look at the signs of the times, what are you seeing? What is it? What do you make of all that you see? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is that statement that said, you know, we knew he would come, mm. but we did not know that he would come so soon. Mm. Mm. You know, I've been a student of prophecy since 1996, Mother Marcus. That's when I came into the church. I came into the church through prophecy. My first Bible study ever was the book of Daniel chapter 2 followed by Daniel chapter 7. And then I went through great controversy in the prophetic chain. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you that uh, in all my years of watching prophecy and turn into prophetic pages and as they unfold we're not predicting but we could watch the prophetic pages on turn and we flip them with the bible i've never seen anything in my life like what we're seeing this year and i'm, mm. and I'm praying trusting and hoping that god may give us perception that our eyes may be open mm. now uh, there's many things that we want to share so you let me know when you're ready and, and we could jump right in all right well i tell you what i mean because of the because of the hour let's not let's not waste too much time go ahead and and, you know, share, share with us what's on your heart, what the Lord has given you as it relates to prophecy. I mean, we have the pandemic wide open. You know, yes, I'm reminded yes. of something. You know, when the pandemic started, all of the conversation was around whether it was planned or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes. who was responsible? 
And by mm-hmm. now, that question doesn't even make sense to ask anymore. It is no, here no. and it is a thing and it is affecting life and it's actually turned life upside down in every way. Every facet of our life has been touched and affected. How we do things has all been changed. So yes, now, yes. you know, um, I've done a little bit of traveling. I've talked to a lot of people and I know mm-hmm. that you have too. Uh, sh- go ahead and share with us what the Lord has put on your heart as you look at 2020 and the different events. And, uh, and I'll just kind of jump in as you're going, as, uh, as, you, as you're talking through what the Lord has given you for us this evening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And okay. uh, whenever you're ready to, to jump in, I'll just come out of the share so that, you know, uh, every, everyone can see us di- in dialogue. So let me go ahead and try to share my screen here. Give me okay. one second to get this All going. Right. All right. Let's see here. Here it is. All right. All right. Uh, are you seeing my screen full screen? Yes, we can see you full screen, my friend. All right. Now, I believe my brothers and sisters, and in fact, I'm going to have another word of prayer before we jump in because we're living in very serious times, and I believe that we need prayer in such a time as this. So bow your heads with me. Lord, we are praying now for your wisdom and your guidance, Lord, to help us and navigate through the crisis that's right before us. And I pray, O Lord, that you're still in these last final minutes and moments of Earth's history. That you help us to have perception, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, I believe that it's high time. And we're told in the book of Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 that, and knowing the time that now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, but now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That's the book of Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to turn me to the book of First Chronicles chapter 12. And I want you to notice two things in this verse. And this text is not an unfamiliar text to us, but I want us to bring out a few more things in this verse that we might have not considered. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. And the Bible says in the book of First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32, it says, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. Now, one of the first things I want to point out is that the children of Issachar is actually mentioned in a book of Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, the Bible mentions 12 tribes, 12,000 from 12 tribes, which comprise 144,000. And I believe that we must comprise the characteristics that's outlined from these 12 tribes. Now, one of the top tribes that is mentioned is the tribe of Issachar. And the Bible points out two things about these children of Issachar. The Bible says they are men that had understanding of the times. And then it goes on to say to know what Israel ought to do. Now, let me pause there for a moment. And Brother Mark has brought this out in the intro. The understanding is something that we must perceive. We must, uh, you know, gather the intended meaning. Let me just say it this way. Sufficient information does not necessarily translate to understanding. They're not synonymous. A person could have sufficient evidence but still not understand. That's why the Bible said they have eyes and see not. They have heads but they do not understand. So these children, the Bible says, has understanding of the times. But it doesn't stop there. It also says to know what Israel ought to do. Now, my brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that we're living in the most solemn times. And I believe that the people of God in these last days need to understand the time so that we can, in essence, know what to do. Let me give an illustration. Suppose I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm trying to figure out my next move. Let's say I'm trying to figure out if it's time to roll back over and go to sleep or if it's time for me to get up and prepare to go to work. What's the first thing that I need to check? The first thing I need to check is the time. Once I see the time now, then I know what to do. If I see the clock in the morning, then I know that it's time to get up and go to work. And what I want to share with us tonight is that it's time for us to get up and go to work. It's not time to roll back over and go to sleep. It's too late in the game, my brother and sister. We need to wake up and go to work. So these children of Issachar has understanding of the time. Now let me point out this. Jesus, my friends, is our example. And we're told that Jesus was never by surprise. In fact, his first message was the time is fulfilled. The Bible says, my time is not yet. 
Jesus says, time is at hand. He also says, Jesus says, Jesus knew that his hour was come. In other words, he was never taken by surprise. He always understood the times. My question is this, do we understand the time? Do we truly understand what we're seeing, my brothers and sisters? Or are we blinded? Now, if you, if, if you check the pulse of this world, you, you realize that the world is not, uh, is not sleeping. The world is watching. They, they might not understand, but they're watching. They're seeing that something stupendous is about to break loose. Look at this. Look at this. This is the midst of a pandemic. When people are, are, are worried about the coronavirus, you see that the world, and, and, and by the way, as Brother Marcus pointed out, we're not uh, predicting or prophesying or, or, or trying to conjure up whether it's, you know, came from rats or bats or snakes or whatever it is. It's real and it's really killing people, but we're going to study the implications of it. But what I want to share here is that these people are rallying together, banding together in the midst of a pandemic, bunched up in crowds. Why? Because they have a cause that they're pushing forward. Mm. And once you notice some of these signs, human change, not climate change. One earth, one chance. And the world is saying this, this is our, and you see that sign in the back? It says it's time. Notice that. This is the world, my friends. Now, what do you notice what the Lord said about this? It says here, soon strife among the nations will break out with an intensity that we do not now anticipate. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living rulers, statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention, notice, fixed upon the events taking place about us. So they're saying that the, these events are not normal. They're saying these events are translating into something. Now watch what this says. This is powerful. So they are watching the strain. Now watch. They are watching the strain, restless relations that exist among the nations. We have the, not only do we have the global uh, uh, climate change and all these things that's being pushed forward, but we also have the racial tensions and the unsettled state of society. And we're told that they observe the intensity that is taking possessions of every earthly element. And they realize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous mm. crisis. crisis. Mm. We're, we're told that the world is watching. The world is observing. The world realizes that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis, which lets us in again. What about the church? What is our condition? You know what our condition is? Watch what this says. You see that? That's the unfortunate condition of the church right now. And the prophet of God tells us in the book of Evangelism, page 32, that the world is perishing in ignorance of God's holy law and Seventh-day Adventists are asleep. We are fast asleep, my brothers and sisters, while the world is watching. Now, I'm not sure if you guys heard of this, but the world, since 1947, has something called a doomsday clock. A doomsday clock. Now, what is this about? Well, uh, in February of this year, and this is before the pandemic came to its full potential, it says it is now 100 seconds to midnight. Now, I'm just extracting a few slides from a presentation that I have called Almost Midnight. Um, if you want to con con contact us about the series that we have that actually have this message as a part of it in its full entirety, just reach out to us at treeoflifeministries.org or call us at 404-624-6696, and we could avail you to uh, much more in-depth information of, as far as how all this prophetic, uh, uh, the, the whole prophetic year of 2020 come to full fruition. But it said it is now 100 seconds from midnight. Watch what it says here. It says the iconic doomsday clock, symbolizing the gravest perils facing humankind, is now closer to midnight than at any point since its creation in, in 1947. It says it's now been expressed in seconds. Then it says, as a statement is issued today by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists explains, humanity continues to face two st st uh, simultaneous existential dangers. Watch what they say. Nuclear war and climate change. I want you to notice those underlying words. Climate change. You notice those signs? Human change, not climate change. One world, one chance. Our common home. And let me tell you this, my brothers and sisters. I remember a few years back, and I think uh, Elder Mason Sr. used to talk about this as well, how Al Gore started going around and talking about climate change. And I, I, I could tell you honestly, 
seriously. I did not paint it any mind. I did not. Well, I'm, I'm like this. We better pay close attention to the climate change push right now. Because we're going to show you very, very clearly, as clear as the New Dane Sun, that climate change is without question linked to how the national Sunday law will be pushed forward. Now it says, climate change that are compounded by a threat multiplied. Then it goes on. It says, we now face a true emergency, an absolute unacceptable state of world affairs that has eliminated any margin of error or further delay. They're saying we must act now. Now what? Listen to what they say. It says here, um, I'm going to skip this slide. It says here, doomsday clock now stands at 100 seconds to midnight. It says the most dangerous situation that humanity has ever faced. Now listen, now is the time to, to come together, to unite and to act. Now watch. It says climate change just compounds the crisis. And it says if there's ever a time to wake up, it is now. Mm. This is what the world is saying, my friends. And the doomsday clock that they came up with in 1947 says, look, we are now the closest that we've ever been to a crisis. Now, I'm going to show you some things tonight, my friends. Pay very, very close attention. We're going to see where we are in time. Now, I grew up in New York City. I passed the street and, and saw this clock hundreds, hundreds of times. Now, watch what this says. It said the New York clock that told time now tells the time remaining. Now, brothers and sisters, pay close attention to me tonight. Metronome's digital clock has been reprogrammed to illustrate a critical window for action to prevent the effects of global warming from becoming irreversible. And then it goes on, on Saturday at 3.20 p.m., messages included that Earth has a decline, has a deadline, began to appear on the display. Then, numbers, seven, 13, 40, 07, representing the years, days, hours, minutes, and seconds until that deadline. In other words, it is no longer saying 5 p.m. It is no longer saying 7 p.m. It is no longer saying 9 p.m. They said it is more urgent than just to tell a regular time. They said we're going to show how much time is left in this world before a stupendous crisis and an extent, uh, these existential dangers break loose to the point where it is irreversible, my brothers and sisters. What am I saying? The world is saying we are near the end. Now it says we have seven, day, uh, seven years, 103 days, and 15 hours and 40 seconds remaining. That's what they're saying. Watch. It goes on. It says, this is arguably the most important number in the world. It says, the most important number in the world is showing it's all about climate. Now, they have an entire website, Climate Clock, the world. And what is this website about? You can go and check it out. But notice, it says to avoid. Now, listen, this is almost directly from the book of Matthew 24. To avoid famine, drought, floods, displacement, conflict suffering disaster he says if we don't do something to ban and rally together as the entire world in order to avert the climate crisis they said this this will be the results famine drought bloods displacement conflict suffering disaster my brother and sister this is what the world is saying while the church is fast oh. as it uh, uh, it says here for the children of this world are in this generation why is there of light now my question is this what about us? Brother Marcus mentioned it earlier that we are not the children of darkness. We are the children of light. And the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that we should not be taken by surprise. Why? Because we are the children of light. We cannot, you know, I, I remember growing up in New York. Let me just come out of the screen for a moment. I remember, uh, and I'll come right back in, but I remember uh, growing up in New York and um, Growing up in New York, I remember visiting some of my friends in, uh, in the apartment buildings. Oh. And, you know, sometimes I spend the night at a friend's house and we'll, you know, as I do the sleepover, I wake up in the middle of the night, and, you know, to go get me a bottle of water, get some drink of water, you know. And to my surprise, I'm looking around like, whoa, you know, start, start tiptoeing around and jumping over. You know what I'm seeing? Oh. Cockroaches. And what, what frightened them? The light. I believe right now, the Seventh-day Adventists are like the cockroaches that are surprised by the light of prophecy. We don't know what to do, my friends. Right now, 
Uh, there's so many groups that have been contacting me all around the world, and there's a special group right there in Mariposa. Now, I'm telling you, my brother and sister, they're taking hold of this message, and they're taking it and run. And what started? It was this year. They saw <laughs> the light of Bible prophecy. They did not understand of what to do, and by God's grace, they were able to contact us, and we're able to through the scripture and show them where we are in time, but even more importantly, what we need to be doing. It's a group of about 100 of them. We need to wake up, my friends. Let me go back to the screen. My brother Martin, man, I, I'm, I'm fired up and fired up. So you let me know uh, when you want to jump go. in. We got, we, got, we got a little time left. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Good, good. Yeah. Now, where are we? let me jump back in the screen. Where are we with, this, with the climate change and the whole coronavirus? Let me show you something, my brother and sisters. Let's, let's go back and share my screen here. All right, are you seeing it uh, full screen, Brother Marcus? Oh, yeah, looks good, looks good. All right, so what about us? We shouldn't be taken by surprise. Now, I believe, my brother and sister, I'm going to show you the connection now because I, I, I was talking about global cri uh, the climate change, but let me show you something. There's something called Hegelian dialectic. I'm going to show you the connection with the virus now and how that's going to link to climate change. It says here, and you watch, just, just, just the, think about the current pandemic we're in and the reactions to the pandemic, and just and you're going to see how it lines up. Now, it says here, the Hegelian dialectic, where the ruling elite create a problem, anticipating and advance the reaction of the population to the crisis, and thus conditioning the people to call for change. Now listen, Ooh. when the population is properly conditioned, the desired agenda of the ruling elite is presented as the solution. Then, the solution they present is not intended to solve the problem, but to serve as the basis for a new problem or to exasperate the existing one. When the newly created problem reaches the boiling point, it becomes the foundation for the people to clamber for change again. Mm. Now, let me show you the cycle. Watch. It says here, at the, at the top, you have the agenda. And the agenda is centralization of power. And this is, this is something that by a, a guy by the name of George Hegel came up with many years ago, just watching society and how they move. This, this is the world, my friends. He said he's watching the world and, and their movements, and he came up with this dialectic, Hegelian dialectic. Now, watch. It says here, centralization of power. And then you have the thesis. And what is the thesis? The thesis is the first step is to create coronavirus. A problem is there. Then you have the antithesis, which is repressive police state, which is the second step is to generate opposition to the problem, which leads to fear panic and hysteria right now we're in fear panic and hysteria whereas the world is saying whatever the government asks for we're willing to do it in other words in fact some of them are saying i want totalitarian executive orders right now because the, the government needs to do something about this pandemic mm. you can see the steps then watch the third step is a synthesis or the fourth step rather it's really the third but uh, the, it's, uh, it's four steps is the synthesis, which is the rem listen, the removal of freedom, transfer of power from many to few. Now, it says here, in the third step is to offer the solution to the problem created by step one, a change which would have been impossible to impose upon the people without the proper psychological conditioning achieved in stages one and two. What would make us now, think about it, accept as in 9-11, that we can be pat down and go through these advanced scanner machines and accept the, the advanced security that surrounds us. What made us do that? Our mind was programmed and conditioned based on a crisis. 9-11 was also a Hegelian dialectic. What is causing the world right now to say, lock us down. What is causing the churches right now, including our church, to say, look, we are not meeting. We're going to follow the government dictates. What is causing this? We have been programmed because of how our minds have been conditioned based on the crisis. Now, I'm not saying that the crisis is not real. I'm not saying that it's real. I'm not saying that the disease is not killing people, but I'm just sharing with you how our minds have been programmed. We, are, we, we, we accept wearing masks all, all the time. We accept not meeting even amongst families and so on and so forth. Why? Because of the crisis now that has been created is now program in our mind and we are clamoring for change or something better and that's why there's so many people that are saying we want including our own people we need the vaccine immediately i'm, I'm, I'm telling my brothers and sisters the crisis is about to boost now when the coronavirus came the world went to lockdown it started in china 
you can see on the screen the emissions on the top versus the emissions at the bottom. The, the emissions on top is pre-coronavirus. The emissions on the bottom is post-coronavirus. You can see that the air is pure and almost clear. So they said we see a connection now with being locked down and the climate. As a result of the coronavirus, we were locked down and it, 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 it was so effective in clearing the climate. It wasn't only China, also all around the world. You can, you can see back and forth. Mm. This is uh, during, uh, uh, before coronavirus, during all around the world. Before coronavirus, during coronavirus. Now, as a result of the lockdown, we see that the emissions has cleared up. And as a result now, we have found a solution to the climate change. We need to. Now, as a result of the pandemic, it says here, it says coronavirus has shown that in order to averse impacts of a global crisis, world leaders need to come together to make bold change. And then it says the world has been given a trial run in global crisis management, and it says it shouldn't waste it. That's why you have the Pope and other politicians and other people that are coming together and saying, look, the coronavirus has shown us with great clarity. If you lock down and come to a halt and just stop, we see the emissions drop. And they're saying there is even a more dangerous situation than the coronavirus, and that is climate change. And they said the same way efforts are being put forth to avert the global pandemic, even more efforts need to be put forth to avert the climate change so that we can, in essence, protect our common home. Catch that, my friends. Brother Marcus, how much time do I have? Talk to me. Oh, we got about, we got about four or five minutes. All right, let me just run through this really quick. Now, so as a result now, it's not sustainable to completely shut down the, uh, the, the, the environment, uh, shut down the economy, because it's going to lead to a economic crash. So what's the solution? Well, a Baptist minister wrote this article. He says, I have a radical environmental proposal, mm. a day of rest. And watch what he says now. He said, last week as environmentalists around the world celebrated Earth Day, I was intrigued by the potential for a biblical solution to the problem of air pol pollution, a day of rest. Then he says, now newly published information seems to bear out that what, we, uh, what should be obvious, a weekly day of rest could help keep the balance in the environmental system that God established to sustain man's physical existence. And then he says, a day of rest is not a solution for the pr proliferation of the plastics in the oceans, but when it comes to reducing airborne pol pol pollutants, one day off in seven seems to, to, to more than make sense. It is wisdom from above. And then he goes on to Chick-fil-A. He says, look, he says, look, it's not sustainable economically to shut down for, you know, 52 days consecutively. Then he says, what if we do 50 days, 52 days a year? And by the way, how many weeks there are in a year? It happens to be 52. So he says, if we can shut down 52 days per year, one day per week, mm -hmm. then we can see that research has shown that just by coming to a halt one day a week, we can see a impact that it will have on the climate. So he says, what we need right now is to come to find a point where we can stop one day a week. Then he says, look, there's some people that might be worried about how it's going to affect us economically or affect your business to stop one day a week. They says Chick-fil-A comes to a halt. They don't work on Sundays. And when they don't work on Sundays, they make twice as much as their partners. They, they, they're not their partners. They are uh, their, their main competitors. And guess what? Chick-fil-A has 25 in the location. They make $10 billion a year. Kentucky Fried Chicken, Popeye's Chicken. Their two main competitors have 6,500 locations, and they make $7 billion per year. So in 2,500 locations, a third of the locations of uh, Popeye's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, Chick-fil-A makes $3 billion more than both of them combined. And he said, look, if we just trust God and rest on Sundays mm. as Chick-fil-A, then we'll mm -hmm. see that it is a solution, both the e economic change as well as the climate. And then there's entire website set up right now, my brothers and sisters. It says, is there nothing you can do about the environment? Nothing can be one of the best things you can do. One day every week, do nothing. This, uh, this website is called Green. And then Biden, as he signed in, he said, look, when I come in, I'm going to make some ex 
exact orders. He said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get back into the Paris Agreement. Then he says, my very first day, that's what I'm going to do. And he says, I'm going to do it in executive orders which do not require congressional approval. My brothers and sisters, it is high time. My brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. Mm -hmm. My brothers and sisters. Now, there's so many other things taking place, Brother Marcus. Let me just share this really quick. Notice what this says here. This was written many years ago. If Catholics ever gain a sufficient numerical majority in this country, religious freedom is at an end. So our enemies say, so we believe. So in addition to the racial tensions, in, in addition to the, the, the global pandemic, in addition to the, the climate change agenda that's being pushed, in addition to the fact that the president, the pope, pastors, Protestantism are all coming together and saying the same thing. Catholics are now the majority in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. It says, if Catholics ever gain a sufficient numerical majority in this country, religious freedom is at an end. Why do Catholics make up the majority of the Supreme Court? It is now six Catholics out of nine in our Supreme Court. Right. And one of them is an is, is a Episcopalian, which is pretty much the same as a Catholic. What am I saying, my friends? We are high time. Biden is a Catholic. And he received a congratulatory letter from the Pope. You know what the Pope, him and the Pope talked about on their first uh, dialogue as he became president and he received a congratulatory call. They talked about the global change. My brothers and sisters, it is high time. Near the end, Brother Marcus, I'll come back to this. But let me let you jump in so that we can do some more dialogue and as to what's taking place in this world right now. But we can see, truly, it is high time. It is high time, my friends. It is high time. I mean, you, it's, that was laid out very succinctly and in order. You know, one of the questions that came to my mind when you have, you mentioned the Hegelian dialectic. Yes, sir. All right. So now, right now, we have a group of people who they're saying, lock it down. Do what you mm -hmm. got to do. Um, I don't want to be sick. I, I don't want to die. And when people are watching TV and they, they hear the news that people are dying and their loved ones can't come and visit with them and, and all of these bad scenarios that are taking place, that is tearing at people's hearts and minds. But there's yes. still a group of people who don't want to relent. They don't mm -hmm. want to be bothered. They don't want to be told what to do. And, and, mm -hmm. and in my studies, in, in my looking at, at, at what's happening, I'm thinking something has to happen to cause that group of people to begin to relent. Their hope that things are going to get better or that this is nothing and all this has to turn, has to change. And in their minds have to go to, this is out of control. And I thought it was nothing, but obviously it's something, it's, it's oh, forcing yeah. me to admit that it's something and we need somebody to fix it. Because right now I say there's still too much hope in our society. And so That's this right. thing must get worse. Something must That's happen right. to cause even those who have hope that it's either nothing or it'll go away. Because right now we have this vaccine and everybody seems, not everybody, but a large group of people yeah, yeah, yeah. seem to be pinning their hopes of survival on this, on, on getting the, the vaccine. That when we, now, when we take it, huh? Well, they're not advertising how many people have been dying. I mean, you do the research in Brazil. Yeah. Countless yeah. people have been dying. In addition to that, Brother Marcus, looking at the prophetic application of it, and that's something as traveling evangelists that we must consider. They're saying, and one, uh, one uh, airline in Europe, I can't remember exactly which one, they said as soon as that coronavirus vaccination is legalized and, and finalized, they said no one boards this plane without a vaccination. You're talking about you Qantas that. Airlines. I think it was Qantas said no one Quantas boards this airline without a vaccination. And it, all it takes is one, right? That's it. And then next you know, all the other airlines may start beginning to follow suit. With that, that's something that we have to consider. Praise God for technology. Uh, but I'm, I'm letting you know right now, my brother, that we are living in super times. We're, we're here. I want, I want to show something on the screen right quick that, that talks about what you, what you just talked about. Mm -hmm. It says, Qantas boss says passengers will need to be vaccinated for international flights. Mm. It says, Australia's national carrier Qantas will require future international travelers to prove that they have been vaccinated against COVID-19 before flying. 
The airline uh-huh. CEO, Alan Joyce, said in an interview with CNN affiliate Nine News on Monday that the move would be a necessity when coronavirus vaccines are readily available. Then mm-hmm. I'm going mm-hmm. to skip through to the next one. It says, whether you need this domestically, we will have to see what happens with COVID-19 in the market. But certainly for international visitors coming out and people leaving the country, we think that ne- that's a necessity, the Qantas chief said. While wow. Qantas wow. is the first airline to indicate that, quote, that COVID-19 vaccinations would be a must before travel, others could soon follow suit. This mm. is what I found wow. interesting. It says, I think it will be a common theme talking to my colleagues in other airlines across mm. the world, Joyce says. Wow. So mm. it, it's coming. It's, it's already in their minds. You know how they like to feed us a little bit at a time? They oh, yeah. to talk about it, and then you realize it's coming, that they really weren't just talking. It was really part of the plan. A lockdown will happen slowly enough that we will, that many people will just welcome it and lay down and just kind of let it happen because we want to be safe. And so one of the things that stands out to me about this pandemic is that for, for <laughs> lack of a better way to explain it, it was, an unfors- it was an unexpected and unseen calamity, so to speak, that shows up. Yep. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody was prepared for it. As a matter of fact, even when it started, I know for me, I wasn't thinking anything about it. I'm like, the pandemic is that's in China. <laughs> yeah, when it came true. here, yeah. <laughs> and when it came here, I was thinking, oh, that's out in, in Washington State. That's not down here in Tennessee. I, I, that, you know, <laughs> I, I just didn't pay it any attention until it started rolling and it started picking up steam. And I'm thinking, what, what, what in the world? And then watching people, the, the world, realize, wait a minute, something's wrong here. They're making a rush to the grocery store and they can't find toilet paper and you can't find food. Mm. And, and then shortly thereafter, my wife is gotten into canning. So we were looking for canning supplies and couldn't find any. Mm. Why? Same thing, with, wo- same thing with seeds. Same thing huh? with seeds. Same thing, same with, thing seeds. with seeds. You can't find seeds. Why? It's not because we're buying all the seeds. The world has woke up and said, wait a minute. Something's going on here, and I realize that I need to be able to survive on my own. I need to be able to grow my own food. And I always go back to, if we had just listened to what the prophet said a long time ago, we would already be prepared for something we didn't know was coming. But it's the same way with country land. Lots of people are looking for country land. They're calling every day. You know, do you do you do you have any land? Do you know anybody who's selling land? And then this is what they're finding every time they go to look at a property that has a house on it, there's already a contract on it. As oh, it even man, gets put it. on the market, it's already being snapped up. Why? Because we're competing with the world to buy property now. Now, now Brother Marcus, I was in Black Hills. I did a series in Black Hills, mm. and the guy was giving me a tour of the area, and um, he said the people in California are actually buying property without even seeing it. Yes. Those things. Those same friends that I say about in Mariposa in California, yeah. they are buying properties without seeing it. There's, mm. They said, every time I get there, if I get there the next day, it's gone. So they, they said, as soon as I saw it, I put a contract in. I didn't mm. even see it. Wow. And uh, the, the, the rich folks in New York, they had the money. Yeah. I think, I can't remember the percentage now. It's like 13 or 33, something with a three, the 13 or 33 percent. The housing mm. in Manhattan is down. You know, they are, they're in the country. They're in the country. In the country. The so, same thing that we've had for years. Same, same, same things we have for years. And so, you know, now that many people want to do what God says, they're, they're seeing it. They're finally, it finally makes sense. Now that they're going mm-hmm. to do it and it's like nothing's available. I, I, I can't get out. Uh, the door seems closed. And I'm like, you know, brothers and sisters, some of us aren't going to make it out. I don't know who that is. I'm not passing judgment on no one. What we ought to do is get on our hands and knees and beg God for a change. And if he sees fit to open the door, to let us do what we now recognize we must do. Um, you know, I, was, I, I got now, a picture here. Go ahead. Now, you, 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 I want to bring this up because I was encouraged by a few things that you, you, you know, when you called me the other day and we caught up a little bit before we set this time up. Um, 
my, my friend calls and not gave me a call a couple weeks ago. He said, my brother, I don't hear any chisel and hammer in the background. He said, we should be building an ark. He said, every mm. time I call you, I need to hear chisel and hammer in the background. Mm. And you, you share with me um, some things that you, you're doing personally mm. uh, that tells me that you have your chisel and your, and your hammer and your hoe uh, working as well. So I, I think it would be good for people to know. You mentioned the, 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 the tail end of it, what Barbara is doing, but Barbara can can something that's not there to can, if you get what I'm saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, we, we, I, I want to be clear with all of the viewers. Here yeah. at Apocalypse Ministries, Brother Narlin and his ministry, by God's grace, we're not preaching something that we are not trying to accomplish right. and do by God's grace. We, the reason we know that seeds are highly unavailable is because we, are, we went looking for them and found them. And I believe God helped us to be able to open a door so that we can make them available to our people. You should look for that That's coming right. soon. Um, but greenhouses and building greenhouses and building raised beds and growing our own food Amen. and getting our hands dirty is it's what we must do. And we're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow afternoon and uh, uh, when we're talking about the physical preparation. Brothers and sisters, we must be building this ark like Noah did. He never wasted a moment in building the ark. Every day, hammer, chisel, sermon reminding the people what was, what was coming. And then one day, the animals got out of the woods, made friends with one another, and walked on the ark together because they knew what was about to happen. They were being led by an angel to get on the ark so that they can survive. You know, I'm looking around, and I saw something. Um, I, I don't know how much time we have left. But we, we got a few moments. I, went, I wanted to go here and get your thoughts on this one here. I'm going to go to the screen here. First, well, before we do that, let's, let's go to the screen, and I want you to see this. Employers, talking about this vaccine, mm. can bar unvaccinated employees from the workplace. This is coming from the EEOC. Mm. Wow. It says, when the fir with the first doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine now being administered in the U.S., the federal government is giving employers around the country the green light to require immunization for most workers. In general, companies have the legal right to mandate yes. that employees get a COVID-19 shot. The Equal, Opportunity and, uh, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission said Wednesday. More specifically, employers are entitled and required to ensure a safe workplace in which an individual shall not pose a direct threat to the health or safety of individuals in the workplace. That can mean a mm. company requiring its workforce to be vaccinated. Now, this mm. last paragraph, listen to this. <laughs> the Americans with Disabilities Act limits an employer's ability to require workers to get a medical examination, but the EEOC's latest guidance clarifies that getting vaccinated does not constitute a medical exam. As a result, ordering employees to get a COVID-19 shot would not violate the ADA. Mm. Brother, things are clamping you know, down. I got, it's funny you bring this up. I got a call from a friend of mine. He's an um, anesthesiologist. Mm. He said, I want to know what you guys are doing at Red River because uh, I'm, I'm looking at options. Mm. He said, tell me what's going on. He said, look, the way things are going at the hospital that I work, they're going to mandate that vac vaccination. Wow. And as soon as they do that, my brother, we're coming to join you. So uh, it, it, it's real. So people are, are seeing this and they're saying, look, I, I have to begin to make pre preparations for my future. If this is mandated, then obviously I'm going to have to do something else. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this, this is real. This is, this, real. This, is not, uh, this is not a fly by night thing. This is real. It's here. It's here. I got two more, I got two more things. I'm going to your, get your thoughts on this before yep. we get ready to close out. I'm going to read this last paragraph about this vaccination to, uh, about these employees. It says, not all employees at the very top, not all employees must get vaccinated according to the agency. Employees with either a disability or, and you see in quotes, sincerely held religious beliefs 
that prevent them from getting inoculated are exempt, according to the EEOC, which is charged with enforcing laws against workplace discrimination. I, I cannot speak to and say what, quote unquote, sincerely held religious beliefs would be. But I don't think it's anything that somebody can just say, for my religious belief, I don't want to get the vaccine. I think it's going to be something you have to prove that your belief, your religion, states that you cannot. And that, yeah, doesn't, and care, that doesn't cover very many people. That's the sad part, because we used to have the ability to have you know, a conference and pastors write us letters and say, look, we, this, we do not believe in this. Mm -hmm. Those opportunities are gone. Okay. We're no longer backed by the church with exemption because, based on religious belief because the church themselves is saying that we need to be vaccinated. So yeah. you can see the bind that we're in as a church. So we, yeah. we don't even have any religious like to stand on. That, that's the sad part about it. Mm. And, you know, to touch based on the vaccine real quick, uh, are you familiar with who backs all of this uh, vaccinations and so on and so forth? Financially? You're talking about Bill Gates? Bill Gates. Bill Gates is the... He, he's he's the number one financial backer and investor. He, he says don't donate, but uh, mm. uh, for some reason he, his uh, his his resources begin to triple. Uh, so I don't know how you start donating eleven billion dollars to this and three hundred billion dollars. I'm, I'm not talking like a hundred thousand right. dollars. Eleven billion dollars. He's the number one funder for every single uh, World Health Organization. He's the number one funder. Now. The funny thing is, um, of course, we know he has nothing to do with vaccinations, period. Mm -hmm. But we also know that he's one that believes, has stated publicly that he believes in population control, control. and now he's given vaccinations. Yes. And, and as one of my friends says, and you know it because you're in this, this space, Bill Gates can't even keep viruses off our computers. <laughs> How in the world is he going to keep viruses off our bodies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean... It is amazing to me that we will believe and depend on a man who believes in reducing population and him be the yeah. one that backs the vaccine vaccines. Like those two exactly. don't go together. Like, like we read in the beginning, can two walk together unless they agree? Those yeah. two cannot exactly. walk together. You no, want to reduce no, no. population, but you want to offer a vaccine to save life. Those two yeah. thought processes That's cannot mix. Oxymoronic. Yeah. It cannot mix. Yeah. But this is where we are. The world is in chaos. Like it says in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, we are watching those prophecies explode in front of us. When it says that, that uh, men's hearts will fail them for fear for what's coming on the, on the earth and talking about the, the issue of perplexity with mm -hmm. the sea and waves roaring, we see that people's uh, hearts are failing them for fear. I read an article the other day that I referenced at a week of prayer where mm -hmm. it says in the month of October, more people in Japan, more people committed suicide mm. than all of the people who got infected and died in Japan for 2020 from COVID. More people there's, committed there's another suicide. Country. Yeah, there's another one. I think it's an S country. I'm not sure if it's I can't remember the name of it, to be honest, but mm. their suicide rate has tripled in 2020. And the number of those who died from the in comparison to those who died from suicide is very minute. Very so minute. you can see that, you know, when Ellen White says in volume 9, page 11, that there will be an unsettled state of society. Yes. yes. That's what we are right now. That's what it is. Man. Yeah. And, and, and here's what's interesting. In, in Japan, it never really got out of control like it was in other places. So they no. were just looking at what was coming mm -hmm. and getting depressed and taking their life. It hadn't even come there. That's right. I said, man, how, how, do you, how do you take your life for looking after what's coming? But I go to the word and I see it right there in Luke 21. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. Just fear. scared of what's coming. That's right. And there's no real answer. When you, when you look at the news and you see Fauci and Donald Trump and William Barr and all of these voices, you look at the news and you hear all these voices and everybody's saying something different. That's what right. What you come away <laughs> with as a person is they don't, they don't have an answer. And then I look yeah. at the spirit of prophecy that says 
that statesmen and educators would struggle to find an answer to the issues that, that plague society, but they will come up with none. Yeah, and you know, and to, to your point, we're told that every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt, what Daniel and his friends were in Babylon. They were the solution to the problem. That's right. During the, uh, during the pandemic and with the, um, the Spanish flu, we have institutions that saw hundreds of patients and not mm. one of them died. Yes, so right. we actually have the solution, medical missionary work, hydrotherapy, mm -hmm. and, um, and the, the lifestyle practices. Those who are being affected by the virus more than anyone else are the ones with comorbidities, which is high blood pressure and diabetes type 2 and different things of that nature. We have a plan and a program that God has given us to avert these lifestyle diseases mm -hmm. through the lens of medical missionary work. That's it. And that's why we're told we come to a time when every member of the church should take all the medical missionary work. When especially? She says, as religious aggressions begin to subvert the liberties of our nations, men should, while they have opportunity, become intelligent regarding the disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. And those who do this shall find a field of labor anywhere. Mm -hmm. We're there. That's We're the there. point that we need to bring out. We need to t take hold of the medical missionary work that God has telling us, uh, has given us all these years to be a solution to the world's problem, like Joseph in, e in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's right. That's it. That's why, you know, here we, we've begun offering the medical missionary class. Um, Amen. We're doing it, you know, you can attend in person or you can attend virtually uh, to, to, to open it up to, to, to do that very thing, understanding that the medical missionary work must be engaged in right now. It's not optional. It it, we must engage in it. So if we need to be trained, it's time to get trained. We need to study. We need to dig in and understand the ministry of healing. That's why we... We put on these classes so that people can can get can gain the tools and the knowledge and to be a part of this work. So that statement that I quoted from was Ministry of uh, Medical, no, Council on Health, rather, page 506. And to your point, it says they should while they have opportunity, mm -hmm. which tells us that it's a time when they will no longer have opportunity. Have opportunity. It also says soon there'll be no work done in ministerial lines but medical, medical missionary. missionary. In other words, if you have not learned medical missionary work, it comes a time that you will not have anything to do. You will have it. <laughs> wow. Man. We're there. Brother, as we, as, you, as we talk, we just become more clear that it's not a new gospel. It's the same gospel. We just need to continue studying. We need to understand it. And then where we are deficient in an understanding or where if we can see where we are is not where we should be. We should be seeking God's help to get where we need to be. If we don't understand medical missionary work, then it's high time while we still have an opportunity to understand it, to study it, to be a part of it. Because if we believe the prophet, as we read in the beginning, mm -hmm. God speaks to the prophet first. The prophet speaks mm -hmm. to us. If we believe what the That's prophet right. said about it, then shortly... If we don't understand medical missionary work and, and we, we will not be able to engage, we won't have anything to do because largely the, the ministry aligns that work will be shut off. The medical That's missionary right. work will, is what will go forward. So now I, I got one other thing that I, I want us to touch on before we go this evening. This just came out maybe a few days ago um, mm -hmm. as we go to the screen here. Uh oh. All right. Big business. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah gets yeah. its wings as leaders from major U.S. companies partner with Pope Francis. Mm. Capitalism met Catholicism on Tuesday mm. as some of the world's biggest business and investment leaders announced a new partnership with Pope Francis. Mm. Man, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I'm like, Revelation 18 and, is happening. And, and that article actually... Huh? Yeah, that article also said that Pope Francis has stated in the past that he's not a supporter of capitalism. Right. Um, you know, he, he always said that's something that we shouldn't do. We should stay away from it and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now he's a leader in capitalism. And you notice the connection. U.S. is leading now climate change and coronavirus right. when Biden's in office. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis is also leading the climate change. Yep. U.S. is the leading economy in the world. And now Pope Francis is meeting with business owners all around the world, which the U.S. leads the financial aspect of it. 
Mm -hmm. So you could see now, Revelation 13, these two leaders, U.S., Rome, U.S., Rome. U.S. goes down morally, Rome goes up in popularity and power, and that's how the, the Bible tells us the mark of the beast is going to come together in Revelation 13. When, when, when I saw this article, I, I could not believe my eyes. I'm like, now, what does Rome <laughs> and capitalism have, to, have in common? What, what is the Pope going to do? And I find it, they, they announced a, a new partnership with the Pope. This alliance knows it known as the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. It, it, they, they want to talk about a sustainable platform of trade. Now, wait a minute. They're already the biggest companies in America. If you're that big, you're not just in America. You're over there, too. Mm -hmm. So That's right. what are you concerned about a fair trade platform already? You're not being fair to begin with. If you're that large, you're doing things, in other words, to get that big. Now, you're going to come together, and it's the largest ones, and I believe the number they represent is like 1.2 or $2.1 trillion of our economy. Mm. And they're coming together with the Pope. And I were, I'm reminded in Revelation 18 about the mm. merchants who, who, who are looking at Babylon when she falls. And they're looking at what, what are we going to do when she falls? But we, and we're told in, in the spirit of prophecy that the Pope will gain control of the money. Yeah, that's how you control. You can't control buy and sell if you don't control the money. You don't try to. So, so they got to control the money. So it, here was another, you know, you have a lot of events that are happening. You have a lot of things happening. You'll see little things here every you know, day by day. You'll see things. And then you'll see something major. This was, to me, a major shift. That major. they, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of climate change, in the midst of all these things, the largest companies come together to connect with the Pope. Mm. And, and he hasn't even been taught. The only thing he said about capitalism is that he don't agree with it, like you say. So yep. why suddenly would they come together? Where did that conversation come from? And you think, wait a minute, they've been talking about this for a while. This is a plan. And he's it, leading it. And he's leading it. So when yeah. you're the leader, people are going to follow what you suggest. Yeah. And, and so you recognize <laughs> something is already happening. Something is already underway where Rome is going to have control of the money, it's already happening. It's not, this, is not, this is not the first thing. Things have been happening behind the doors. This is just something that's being reported on. And as you mentioned, you know, what's common in these things that we're mentioning is they're global. The pandemic is global. Yes. The, the, uh, the, the, the capitalism with the funding that we were just talking about, which is the Pope control, meeting with business leaders, even though it's not fully global yet, it's going to be global. It's going to be global. It's pretty much global. Yeah. It's going to get there. It's going to get there. I mean, and you know, then you look I, you at know, the climate change. It's global. That's it. I was saying the climate change is also global. so. All of these are global changes that we're seeing. And this, to me, is the the very first telltale sign that what we're seeing is not ordinary prophecy. Everything no, is global. No. The pandemic was not just in America, not just in China. The whole world, and it affected the whole world the same way. Money, people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. People's ability to, to make it. I, I have an article in here I'm not even going to get a chance to get to where a, a lady said she was behind by months on her rent. And, mm -hmm. and at first you say, well, how can she pay her rent? She can't work. But then you, you look at the other side and the landlord hadn't gotten any money for months, but they have bills that they need to pay. So they're like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to put anybody out, but I need some money so I can live. And so it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's global Everything that happens is global. It's not just here. It's global. That's right. And so when you, and I'm like, this is the thing that we should understand that this makes this all different. So, you That's know, right. when, when, when we're seeing what is happening, as we are seeing it, brothers and sisters, the question that we, that we had asked at the beginning is, do you understand what you see? What are you doing about what you see? This mm -hmm. is no time to sit back and hands folded and to be in calm expectancy of the trouble that we were told is coming. We should be working for souls, our own, our families, our church fellow, our fellow, our fellow church members and friends, and then the world. We have a great work to do and a little time. Brother, I'm so glad you joined us here. We, this is not enough time to 
to dig into this. I, I, I feel like in the next year, in 2021, by God's grace, my hope and prayer is that we will be able to do more ministry together uh, here Amen. on the channel, uh, here at the Media Center and at your place. Uh, I seek to, to, to uh, encourage and support the work where it is being done. We ask the same for here. Brothers and sisters, Amen. there's great work to do. You keep uh, Brother Narlin and his ministry in prayer. And please do the same for us here. Um, for those who may not be familiar with you, the ministry, what you guys are doing, where you are, get, give us that information before you go. So our ministry is on Red River Outpost. You can visit our website, redriveroutpost.org. Um, you could find our messages on my personal website, which is Trail of Life Ministries. If you go to YouTube and find Trail of Life Ministries, um, Norlin Edwards, this time Trail of Life Ministries, Norlin Edwards, you find a lot of messages that we've done. We have a 13-part series that we've done on the pandemic. But go to redriveroutpost.org. You get to see a little bit about our, how the Lord has blessed us with this property. So we're on 436 acres in Stanton, Kentucky. Uh, we're about, 40, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what part of Lexington, east of Lexington. And the Lord has blessed us. Uh, this coming year, we're going to finally get our sanitary open. We're going through major renovations right now. We have our greenhouse uh, going and growing. Um, we are uh, canning and preserving, as Brother Marcus mentioned. Uh, we're evangelizing every Thursday without question. We're out in the communities. We're going in, uh, and, and doing what we call our TCI, our Total Community Involvement Program here. So we have not allowed the pandemic to stop our evangelism. Uh, this, event, this, this pandemic can last for years, so we can't stop going out and reaching out to souls. So through our outreach on every Thursday that we do, we have, I think, two or three Bible studies that we started, and we've only started going back out about three weeks ago. And we have two or three consistent Bible studies that's going on. So... Keep evangelizing and um, learn more about our ministry, redriveroutpost.org. If you ever want to come and visit us, just uh, reach out to us at info at redriveroutpost.org. We can schedule you to come and give a tour of our property and see what we're doing. We have a lot of things going on, a lot of initiatives. And our main issue, things that we're working on this year is to expand. We need more staff housing and so on and so forth. So if the Lord puts it on your heart to, uh, to contribute to uh, some of the projects that we, we have going as far as building up more facilities for our staff and uh, for our upcoming students. Uh, you could also find our link to donate at redriveralbums.org as well. Brother Marco, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, man, it's been a blessing, my friend. We ought to do this again real soon. Um, speak Absolutely. to the family for all of us here at the ministry. Tell them we said hello. We love you guys. We'll be praying for you. Happy Sabbath to you. And uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. A blessing. Tell Mama Mason we'll definitely come and see her soon by God's grace as well. All right. She's in the studio. She heard you live. All right. Mama Mason, see you soon. God, by God's grace. She's nodding in agreement. Amen. Amen. All right. Brothers and sisters, we, are, we have come to the end of another year in review uh, prophecy update. Brothers and sisters, the purpose for doing the prophecy update is to just to show and to touch on things that have happened, what they mean to make sure that we have a clear understanding of where things are going and what we should be doing. There are many things that are happening now where Satan is trying to cause God's people to sit back in calm expectancy, to, to not move, to, to, to not have an understanding that causes them to freeze up and to not know what to do. And so what we seek to do here, brothers and sisters, is get into the word of God, to open the spirit of prophecy, to look at the signs, so that God's people will have an understanding that now it is time to move. It is time to prepare for what is coming. Brothers and sisters, it is high time to awake out of sleep, as Brother Narlin uh, read earlier. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. And so if we believe the Bible by faith, if we believe that what we are seeing constitutes the end of the road, then we ought to, by prayer and supplication, seek God's face daily. Spend time in his word. Seek for clearer understanding so that we may understand what we need to do to prepare ourselves for what is coming, to help prepare others for what is coming, and to give this gospel to the rest of the world. I want to, to encourage you to join us tomorrow afternoon 
at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time for another program uh, in the year in review. Uh, it will be a panel discussion with um, some of God's people who are close by who will be talking about their experience. Uh, the, the, the focus of tomorrow's discussion is physical and spiritual preparation for the crisis. Um, our experiences since being in the country, what God is expecting, what we must be doing, the, import, the importance of prioritizing our preparation, spiritual, then physical. What is that about? So I encourage you to join us tomorrow afternoon, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. So you may need to make the adjustment in time for where you are. I encourage you to join in with us. Tell someone else about it, about the program, uh, so that they can join in and receive a blessing. Spread the word about what's happening here at Apocalypse Ministries. We look forward to seeing you on tomorrow evening. Now, before we go, let's have a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are most gracious and thankful that you have spared us to see this moment. And Lord, we have gone through the year 2020, through all of the things that have transpired so far. And Lord, we, there we have at least a, a, a week or so left, Lord, before the new year comes. And Lord, we don't know what else is going to happen. We see many things on the horizon, things that are being set up, things that are happening. But Lord, what we are praying for is your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you to rest, rule, and abide in our hearts. We need you to lead us and guide us. Lord, we need to act, but not out of fear. We need faith. We need a greater faith, Lord, that causes us to obey at all costs. Lord, I pray for each and every person who is watching this evening. Lord, be with their families. Be with them as they lead their families. Be with their children. Lord, all of our children, we want to see them saved. But Satan is working doubly against them. May all of our children see and understand that now is the time. That I don't have a lot of time left. Now I must give my life to the Lord and follow him explicitly and fully. Be with us all this evening, Lord. Protect us and keep us. Bring us back here again for another broadcast of Year in Review tomorrow afternoon, Lord. Prepare our hearts to hear what you have to say to us, that we may receive a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.